what have we seen? 2023, we have just uh, risen from another election where ethnicity was used as a tool for campaign and religion was placed in the front burner. Maybe some of you have forgotten. Um, uh, I was part of uh, a group called G5 there during the election hearing. And what did we do part of Nigeria? And we held a meeting, the governor, the Southern Governor's Forum. I'm from Hukum Zari, because uh, I'm from certain part of uh, the country. Also, inside my own political party, somebody said, look, I... Uh, Well, this event, this annual lecture, gives us another opportunity. It's another opportunity for us to put for thought at this time of our nationhood. This was were spoken by the father of Nigerian nationalism. And by the way, Zeke spoke Yoruba, and he also spoke some Hausa, and of course, his mother tongue, Igbo. He said, each of our three regions is vastly different in many respects, but each has this in common. But despite variety of languages, and custom of different environments. So today, over 60 years, that will separate us. Yes, we remain as one. Perhaps there is a lesson in there for us. We as a nation have moved beyond asking the question regarding whether we want to stay together. From our history, from even uh, the circumstances surrounding this back in education and the role it played when Nigeria was uh, at the crossroads. So we shouldn't be talking about should we be together? We are already together. So the question we should be asking is how? How? Is this structure? How is this? How is the structure benefiting everybody? What structure is best for us all? Remember, in the first republic, this was a parliamentary type of government, and by the time 
the second republic came. He was also willing, he stood election, uh, and willing to work with the federal system of government. So what this tells me is that he's a dynamic man who did not remain adamantly holding on to one system or way of doing things. He was determined to think in accordance with the time. So as we have a conversation around reclaiming this world and linking this to climate change and sustainability, a good question to ask is, if Dr. Namde Asakiwe were alive today and still able to influence Nigeria as they did in the past, what are you telling us right now? One thing we know for sure is that it will not be talking about breaking Nigeria apart or saying that because uh, someone from his part of the country did not win the election, then the country should split. I don't think that is what uh, my leader, uh, Governor Pisa, will be as, uh, uh, as been saying to us. In fact, when I listened to him uh, at the press conference, I And as I sat there, I was talking to my brother, uh, Professor Charles uh, uh, Soludo, because I came from Cairo. He was there earlier before me. I came from Cairo yesterday. And from Cairo to Abuja, we spent five and a half hours there about. Still the same continent. It's not whether from the uh, from north to the southernmost part. Uh, part or from the east to the westernmost part. This is just from one corner, you know, Cairo to Abuja, and we spent five hours. And I told you that uh, some people sat in Berlin, 1886, and they saw everywhere apart and just uh, picked their own uh, part of it. So, what is before us is not just only uniting Nigeria but also uniting Africa. <laughs> so I don't think Zeke will ask us at this time that we should split. No, I believe it will be forward thinking. Focus on how to foster coherence through a structure that is fair to all. In 1949, if you go into the history book, Zeke called it self-determination within the framework of the Federated Commonwealth of Nigeria and the Cameroon. I call it a restructuring along the line of true federalism. There will be less, less focus on who becomes president, especially with reference to the person's ethnicity if we listen to uh, what Zeke has even told us way back in 1949. One of the main reasons that we are concerned about equity and justice in the center is because governance is over-centralized. So it is my hope that the government at the center today moves to the time and listens to the true yearning of the people. Yes, we are facing economic hardship. The uh, VC was uh, greeting everybody and thanking them for coming. That's why this economic hardship, because well, price has gone uh, uh, through uh, uh, the roof. But we will not be the first country in the world to face economic hardship. So as I said in my opening remarks, 
There are two ways to react to the difficulties we are facing. We can sit around and point fingers as to what will have happened if X or Y had become president. Instead of, we can think through how to come out of this hardship. We can innovate out of this hardship through healthy competition and collaboration between and among the federated units. So for me, my party is short. And when I finish saying it, just take the message, don't shoot the messenger, I will be out through the door on my way to Ibadan. So my party shot is a complete restructure of Nigeria is needed. Thank you and God bless you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we will still have to do a slight restructuring of the program before we get very tired. We have to take the lectures. Let me invite to take the presentation of the guest lecturer, Dr. Tochuku Ogwebe. Tochuku, please step forward to take the presentation so that we can take the lecture proper. After which we take the other mic. Tochuku, please. Where is Tochuku? Dr. Tochuku Ogwebe. My respectfully, Dr. Kutoji worked forever for the citation. The executive governor of Anapra State. I think in the absence of our Vice Chancellor, may I hide under your protection and your authority to call on the 12th lecturer, guest speaker, Her Excellency, Madam President. So please come forward and either find a suitable place to sit beside us or stand, however she will want to handle it. Please. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, can someone help me to pick her seat and then let's... Would you want to stand now? Okay. May we invite her to please come and be upstanding. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is a brief citation of Dr. Joyce Hilda Banda, the former president of Malawi. It is to be confirmed that one says that leaders are not born, they are self-made. Excellency, Madam President, Joyce Hilda Banda started her life sojourn on the 12th of April 1950.
now Malawi. Especially you went tomorrow. Be Belongs to those who prepare for it today. Excellency, fortified ourselves for today the social studies and gender studies from Atlantic International University, USA, Rose University, Canada, with honorary on her political career in 1999, three in Malawi's democratic election under the ruling, the then ruling United Democratic Front. Why in Parliament, the then President Baniku Muluzi appointed her as a Minister for Gender and Community Services, where she fought to enact the Domestic Violence Bill and the National Platform for Action on Orphans, Vulnerable Children, and Zero Tolerance Campaign Against Child Abuse. Again, in two thousand and four, Excellency was re-elected into the parliament, though in a different political party with the then ruling president and in confirmation of the submission of Aretha Franklin, that through virtue has no hiding place. and firm resolve to change the narrative. Excellency, Madam President, let funds from the forefront by cutting her salary by 30%, just to show that they too we are making sacrifices at the door. <laughs> and immediately also announce that the President's debt will be sold. Under our watch, Malawi's operational industrial capacity improved from 35% in 2012 to 85% in July 2014. <laughs> A woman of many accolades, prominent of Queen and the African Prize for Leadership for Sustainable, End of Hunger in 1997, and being named the Africa Third Most Powerful Woman by Forbes Magazine in 2011. She has so many global awards ranging from leadership, democracy, girls' rights, to mention but a few. Men and brethren, my excellency both presidential life has witnessed very numerous expository and impactful engagements nationally and internationally. She is involved with many grassroots projects with women, founded the Joyce Vanda Foundation for Better Education, founded the Young Women Leaders Network, 
and the National Association of Business Women and Hunger Project in Malawi. She has served as commissioner for bridging a wall divider. Alongside personalities like Bishop Desmond Tutu and United Nations Human Rights Commissioner, Mary Robinson. She is a member of the Advisory Board for Education in Washington, D.C. and on the Advisory Board for the Federation of World Peace and Love in Taiwan. Her excellence is advocacy for the rights of women is deep rooted in basic principles of human psychology and economic power. Little wonder she is a firm believer that it is only when a woman is economically empowered that she can negotiate at, her, at household level um, that she can negotiate at household level with her. I don't know why this phone keeps going on. This time I want to mention her back. <laughs> I will repeat it again. <laughs> I said that the, uh, uh, I said that this advocacy for the rights of women is deep rooted in the basic principles of human psychology and economic power. Little wonder she is a believer Little wonder that it is only when a woman is economically empowered that she can negotiate at household level with her husband. <laughs> Even about the number of children that the mother of hers can have. A family woman so cherished by her husband that her excellency always profess that her dear husband Richard has been behind her sources and rise to whatever level that she has become. And that her story and legacy is incomplete without his mention. She is blessed with five children. <laughs> his Excellency, the Executive Governor of Ananda State, and my brother. The Vice Chancellor of the greatest university of the moment, the great benefactor of this lecture series, Ojeri Bondigo, the Ziggs family, members of the high table, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome with trembling Her Excellency, Madam President, the 12th Ziggs guest lecturer to give us a presentation in terms of many
and the, my special honor, Professor Uche Askiwe, wife of our great Nandi Askiwe. All distinguished ladies and gentlemen, students, and my favorite group of young people. Today, I'm here to deliver this lecture. But I have a confession to make. I say things as they are. Mm -hmm. So if anybody gets offended, I am sorry, but that's how I'm born. <laughs> People have articulated the great Azikiwen story, where he was born and so on, his story. I will skip that and talk about this great man as African knows him and what I think he stands for. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm in the habit of getting to a place for the first time and finding what I can learn from that country. During the elections of this country, I was privileged to be requested by America to lead the observer team of NDI and IRI. I don't know why, but they just felt this African woman will lead this observer team. While I was here, a live broadcasting channel asked to interview me. One thing I learned for the first time in Nigeria. The question that came from the anchor. So when I went home, the interview with how Nigeria was, I told them about this question, and Malawians were abused. We learn every day, both by. Today, now to my speech, I have decided that I will broaden my faith. We will touch a lot of issues, at the end of which I will ask questions that you will take home. Because Africa needs answers to the issues that are affecting us. Nobody is going to come into Africa to do this for us. We must do it ourselves. And the feet of Africa, the great feet of Africa, led the way. Today, 16th of November, is not an ordinary day. Nazi as the Kiwa would have been 119 as you've heard already. He died at the age of 91 in May 1996. We are here to honor the life of a talent fight for human rights and justice. A man that embodied humanity and servant leadership. A man who we are and have continued to celebrate the great achievement of Africa. We are also a few weeks away from October 1, the day that he became first president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in 1963. A formidable generally changing political activism and presence, whose leadership argument many colonial powers try to vain to block his ascendancy to the president. To the president. I have therefore always wondered why when we talk about our revolutionary leaders, our founding fathers, we will mention Nyerere, Kauda, and we mention Mandela and often leave out as a keyword. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is your duty as Nigeria to act in this place. This is no small name. As keyword was the great man, just as great as Yere, as Kauza, as everyone else. Nobody is going to do it for you but yourself. I will give you an example of what I did myself. Kamuz Banda was attended the first founding meeting of the Organization of African Union. And he invited our team, we were 
committed to go with the great style of this continent. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these social failures are a distinguished celebration of an African giant who through the power of his pain and favor here in Nigeria, Ghana and across Africa, before he invaded to come here and bless
Climate change is no future tense. It has no future tense. Climate change must be discussed in the present tense. It is a current norm and we must aggressively mitigate or adopt to the changes to sustain our generation. We have a responsibility to preserve our future and our children's future. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this then brings me to the issue of wealth, natural resources. We are told that as a continent we hold 30% of the world's minerals. And I have argued that we may have more, even more than that. But yet, we have some of the poorest nations in the world. We, in state houses, those of us who call ourselves presidents and governors and leaders, must tell ourselves every day that the natural resources of our land is God gifts to his people and they don't belong to our pockets.
But I wish you had been given enough training because she had set the foundation for the prosperity and unity of this country called Nigeria. It is pleasing to note that African countries like Zimbabwe and Ghana now have taken the list of measures to impose strong regulatory measures on exploitation and exploitation of their precious minerals. As a continent, we must be vigilant and stop these old and dead night plants that plan to forest air ships and fly out with our precious stones to a known destination. I don't know if you know this, but there are some countries on the continent where you fly with these ships, air ships, and they'll come and land at night and know. Nobody knows whether with the, with the knowledge of the leaders, but they are able to land, load, and leave the country. Here in West Africa, one country has demonstrated that if you change that knowledge, if you take control of your middle, you can become one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So, this should be inspiration for us. This should encourage us. We are a rich continent. We are a huge continent with abundant arable land. That's why sometimes I love when I see the map of Africa against the world. They they put it, they squeeze it so that it looks small. I don't know why there are any others. The last we speaking, we have not rain. But we have a continent where America Europe and India can go in all at once. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is heartbreaking that in spite of this wealth, Africa continues to lose her resources through illicit financial flows. The African Union in 2012 commissioned a, 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 a survey under President Ray Kitt. It is called the Embedded Report, where they had to look at how. It breaks my heart that that responsibility. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the major report I just that multinational corporations are the biggest subject of illicit output, followed by organized crime. That's why we have to be vigilant. We have unfortunately weak governance capacity in most of our countries, and this has created a favorable environment for illegal business to thrive. The panel had it. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this raises some questions on my mind. One, why is it that our African leaders, we African leaders, are not raising others on this malpractice and call for immediate action by the African Union to protect our African world? Natural resources that are also key in the implementation of our own governing agenda. Number two, and this baffles me even more, these illicit outflows from Africa are domiciled in the West and some tax service. Why is it the West? And these two partners. In Africa, social and economic development by returning that money back to Africa. Countries continue to struggle to get money back. That was illegally externalized to go back to banks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the foreign countries, as we have the other day, they are willing to go to the when they return the money to the country, 
They ask the money, the country, how are you going to use it? How did you use it? You must be accountable. Oh, you were not accountable in the first place when you took our money. You see this letter from Jacobin? All oh, this makes me wonder, why do you bless as you will to die to correct this disaster? Why is it that our generation is in the mood to stop this illicit flow for the sake of the general good of the Nandi and Kiwi legacy? As a continent, we are not just losing this huge new resources. This corruption and illegal generation of our resources is a direct contribution to the current suffering of our people through economic stagnation with disease for space, for infrastructure development, and natural disasters. On the point of natural disasters, Malawi this year has had devastating and been devastated by cyclone threat that left over 1,000 people dead and 2 million people displaced. The President of Malawi appointed me to be ambassador for the reconstruction the post cyclone threat reconstruction. So we are building houses and we are distributing food. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and as I have discussed, and what I have discussed so far, shows that there's a direct impact on all these challenges on our women and girls. Men as well, but they have told us that the face of poverty are women and girls. As we speak, and I don't know how this is accepted, as we speak, 50 million girls are out of school in Africa alone. They are abused, they are overweight, they get into early marriages, health, highest victims of maternal death. I don't really want to go into harmful traditions that the children face these poor African girls. If it is in Malawi, they are killed by age nine. I don't want to go into what crazy means because they are sick. If it is Kenya, they are misguided. If it is Nigeria, they are not very misguided by the preference of a boy child. This killing of two. When you are married, it is expected that you still have, have a boy than a daughter. And you find it as a woman. Let me see a boy. If it is a girl, it's not my fault. Why is this child's book? It's not my fault. But these are the challenges and the traditions that is happening all over us. If it is in Ghana, the Nazi it is uh, troubled and they banned this practice in 1995. But we still have 1,400 1, women still in the bush under the troubled tradition. If it is Cameroon, then this child.
Ah, la, la, la. 